What's up, world? Listen, this is Pastor Snell, and we just finished service. I need you to know that the Spirit of the Lord fell heavy upon us, and we are so excited about what God is doing here. I want you to know that today we kicked off a new teaching series entitled The Pivot. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how to adjust to divine detours. Today's message was entitled Connect the Dots. And what you're going to learn is how to just sit still and allow God's plan to connect and come together. And when you do, you'll see the goodness of the Lord. So do me a favor. Don't watch this word alone. I need you to be, man, an Apple apostle, be an electronic evangelist. Copy the link, send it to somebody, share it if you're on Facebook so that they might be blessed as well. So get ready to connect the dots. You're going to have a good time in the word today. We're excited today, friends, that we begin a new series entitled The Pivot. And over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about how to adjust to divine detour. We're going to be talking about how God brings good out of very bad situations. And this is designed to help us really grow in our faith experience and lay hold on divine omnipotence. And so as we go to the Word, I invite you to stand to your feet as we go to the Scriptures today. And I'm going to invite you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 16. And I'm going to read more than perhaps I should, but I want to provide context for those who are not as familiar with the story today. Acts chapter 16, and we're going to begin together at verse number 6. And if you don't mind, just encourage your neighbor, get, turn to your neighbor real quick, give him a fist bump, let him know I'm glad to see you in the house today. Amen. Turn to the other side. Give the neighbor a little bump as well. Let them know I'm glad to see you also. Amen and amen. And if you're at home, do it to the person sitting next to you on the couch. Let them know you're glad to see them as well. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 6. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. And again, I'm going to read a good bit today, uh, but we'll settle on a small portion. Acts 16 and verse 6. The Bible says, Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Messia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with them, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course to Samothrace. Next, and the next day we came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside when prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. And now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Then the Bible says, This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned aside and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace and to the authorities. And then they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. 
and they teach customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to receive and to observe. Then the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your what? Household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in their house. And he took them that same hour of night and washed their stripes. And immediately him, he, and all of his family were what? Baptized. But again, I want to just read for emphasis verse number six, because this is where we will rest. The Bible says, and when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost. Are y'all catching this, church? No, no. Are y'all catching this? They were forbidden to preach the word in Asia. And after they came to Messiah, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Today, saints, for a little while, I'm going to talk to you under the subject, connect the dots. Connect the dots. Let's pray together. Father, We pray for a distinct and special visitation of your spirit. Father, I pray that you would give us as much of your spirit as our hearts can contain. And so, Father, you are working in somebody's life in a way that they cannot comprehend. So, Lord, I'm praying that matters would be settled, that clarity would be granted and that the voice of the Spirit would be more pronounced in our hearing today. Lord, would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those that believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. We'll just allow a few more seconds for those to come in and be seated. Again, talking to you today under the subject, connecting or connect the dots. <laughs> you know, friends, most people are in a fight that they cannot win. Because we are mostly led by our desires, we cause our preference to wind up in a constant fight with divine providence. And as a result, we suffer many defeats and griefs and sorrows because we write our plans in pen and we write God's plan in pencil. And sometimes the assumption is that spiritual strength is seen in how rigid we are when the truth is that sometimes spiritual strength is seen in how flexible we are. 
And the point of this entire series is that all of us at some point are going to have to pivot or adjust from the plan we initially made. There are times where we will have to pivot because of a divine detour, and there are some that will have to pivot, as the kids say, because life be lifing. There are some that have to pivot because of a divorce. There are some that had to pivot because of a death. There are some that have to pivot because of a pregnancy. And some had to pivot because of a divine opportunity. And the thing I need somebody to get that is that it is ultimately biblical to have to pivot. Remember in Proverbs chapter 16, the Bible says that in a man's heart he plans his course, but it is the Lord that determines his steps. In Proverbs chapter 19, the Bible says many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the purposes of the Lord that prevail. And the truth is that your boy Moses was cool keeping sheep in Midian, but he had to pivot when God confronted him at the burning bush. Remember that Saul was comfortable persecuting the church, but he had to pivot when God knocked him off of his high horse. Remember that Gideon was comfort on the threshold threshing floor, but he had to pivot when God called him into leadership. The apostles were comfortable in the fishing business, but they had to pivot when God called them to be fishers of men. Remember, Rahab only knew life in Jericho, but she had to pivot when God gave her a divine opportunity. And what we'll learn from our text today is that sometimes even the intentions of the most spiritual people are not in harmony with divine plan. And somebody is not necessarily called to make a pivot today. But what God is calling us to is an elasticity in our thinking, a dexterity in our faith, to not be so committed to any circumstance so that when God calls, we have room in our minds to adjust and pivot to the place where God is calling us. And see, the thing I need somebody to know about faith is that faith doesn't always operate like concrete. Sometimes it functions like clay so that you can be molded and shaped after divine purpose. Are you with me today? And is there anybody that can testify that some of the greatest blessings in your life are the result of a detour or a pivot? In fact, this is my testimony. It's crazy. Growing up in Tallahassee, Mayan Boyd, I would always plan to go to Florida State or Florida A&M University. I remember it was my senior year. I had gotten accepted into both schools. I was going to study English and maybe teach or go to law school. And I remember I was near at the point of graduation where some folks start talking to our family about attending Oakwood. I wasn't trying to hear it because I didn't know anybody there who was my age. But I remember we got invited to come to alumni weekend about four weeks before I was supposed to graduate. And I came here at a sign of a pivot. And when I came over University Drive and saw the hills in the background, I just began to sense a divine move in my life. And it's crazy because we began praying about it, but we were not sure if we had the money. In fact, I didn't apply until the month of July. But I need you to know that we stepped out in faith, and by the time I got here in August, we had the money, I had the financial aid, I had a dorm room, and God blessed me to get in school. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that it wasn't until the end of my freshman year that I embraced fully my call to the ministry. And it was because I pivot that I found my calling. It was because I pivoted that I met my wife. It was because I pivoted that I found South Central. It was because I pivoted 20 years ago that I'm your pastor in this church today. And what I'm saying to somebody is that sometimes the blessing is not in always the way you saw it. Sometimes you get the greatest blessing when you adjust to the detour that God put in your life. Are you hearing me today, friends? 
And so let's go back to this word and unpack it a little bit further. As we look to the scriptures, Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, the Bible says, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Messiah, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Bible says that the Spirit would not permit them. Now, friends, I need you to get that there are four simple lessons that I want to espouse as we begin this teaching series. And the first thing this teaches us is that in order to pivot, you've got to have a strong spiritual antenna. In other words, friends, you've got to have a connection that operates in real time that lets you know when God is telling you to move, when God is telling you to be still, and when God is telling you to pivot or adjust your path. And see, this story personifies it as much as any story in the Scripture because here we find Paul on a mission for Jesus Christ. And you've got to understand that Paul eats the mission. He breathes the mission. He sleeps the mission. And they have intended that they're going to go over into Asia, but the Bible says that the Spirit uh, forbid them to go. And so they pivot, Dave, and they look to go into Bithynia, and the Bible says that the Spirit would not permit them to go and preach. Now, I need you to get this, saints, because this is relevant for the church, that when they plan to go to Asia, that their intentions are noble and their aspirations are good. In other words, they're not going over to Asia to turn up. They're not going down to Galatia to try to club. They're not showing up in Asia to try to hurt nobody. They're actually going with good intentions and aims. But what this is showing, church, is that the blessings of God don't fall on good intentions. The blessings of God fall on his instruction. Let me say it to y'all on this side. That God doesn't bless good intentions. God blesses those that follow his instruction. And see, there's a larger idea for our consideration because the Holy Spirit does not just keep you from doing wrong. The Holy Spirit keeps you from doing right at the wrong time. Oh, God. See, see, we think the Holy Spirit just keeps you from doing the wrong thing, but God will keep you from doing the right thing in the wrong place. And, and see, there are some that are somewhat frustrated because, man, your intentions for your moves are good. You're not trying to be messy. You're not trying to be sloppy. And you're wondering why good intentions are not coming to pass. And then the question you've got to ask, are my good intentions ordained in intentions. Are, are my good motives sanctioned by God because you can be doing the right thing in the wrong place or at the wrong time? In other words, young person, it is right for you to want to be married, but guess what? It's got to be at the right time, and it's got to be to the right person. Y'all mighty quiet today. It, it is good for you to want to invest in a home, but it's got to be the right home and in the right market. It is good for you you don't want to start the business, but it's got to be in the ordained season and with the ordained partners. It is good for you to want to witness for Jesus, but God has got to aim you with the right people who have an appetite to receive what God has put in your heart. Are y'all with me today? And see, I need you to note, friends of mine, that the apostles will wind up going to all of these regions eventually, but what God would do is he would withhold them until the hearts of the people were ripe. He would not let them go until the hearts of the folk were ready to receive it. And what I need you to know, friends, is that sometimes when it feels like God is with, with, uh, withstanding you, it is simply 
because God is fastening your circumstances. He is preparing your predicaments. He might be making it ready or God might be making you ready for what he has in store for you. Y'all not with me today. In other words, I need you to know that God has a particular job for you. But sometimes God will put you on hold so he can remove, remove the boss that's going to persecute you and he can remove the co-workers that's going to sabotage you. Uh, there are times where you wanted to close on a house this year, but God put you on ice until the interest rates fall a year from now and you can get more house for your money. Y'all don't believe in here today. That there are some of us that are mad because we couldn't get into a certain class this semester when God held you back because your husband or wife is going to be in that class next semester. And, and, and what I'm saying to somebody today is you've got to believe the promise of Psalm 84 and verse 11. But the Bible says that God is our son and our shield and he will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. Do I have at least seven folk that believe that if God withholds it, then it's not for you. If God withholds it, then it's not a good thing. In other words, the only thing that God withholds are things that will damage you or things that are not ready for you. See, sometimes God is withholding, not because he's saying no. He's saying it's just not ready yet. Are y'all with your boy today? Uh, let me say it this way, like in my house, man, my daughter, man, she is into this baking thing. She is infatuated with it. My girl be making cupcakes and cakes of all types and sorts. And it's crazy because like, man, we at this space, well, we know a little better now, but when she first started baking, as soon as the cake came out of the oven, me and her brothers was like, yo, let's go ahead and cut that thing right now. But what she would do, she would say, Daddy and brother, you, you got to wait. We got to let it cool before we ice it. We've got to let it cool before we cut it. And it's crazy because if you cut it as soon as it comes out of the oven, it's kind of fragile. It'll begin to crumble. So sometimes you've got to let it sit for a little bit. Because when you let it sit, it comes together. When you let it sit, it gets dense. When you let it hit, it can sit, sit. It can withstand the cutting process. And to us, we think she's withholding when the truth is she's just preparing. And can I suggest to somebody, you think God is withholding when God is just preparing what he's ultimately ordained for you. Are you hearing me today? And see, my larger point, body of Christ, is that you've got to have an active spiritual antenna. And see, notice, man, the Bible says that, listen, they are ready to go and preach. And the Bible says he forbids in one instance. Then they turn to go to Bithynia, and the Bible says that he would not permit them to go in another instance. Now, see, the problem is, when we read this, we always assume that there is some type of theophany, that there is a burning bush that God speaks in an audible voice to let them know they are going in the wrong direction. But most scholars believe that what happens is an example of what they call thought inspiration where God does not show up with a trumpet or a burning bush, but God speaks to them through the still small voice of the Holy Ghost. Are y'all with me today? So I need you to get this thing because everybody in the convoy, they are ready to go, man. They didn't got themselves all worked up about preaching the gospel over in Asia. They are beginning to pack their supplies and put all of their tools on the donkey. And as they begin to set out on their mission, I don't know what they see. I don't know if Paul and Luke notice it at the same time. But as they move forward, they can sense something holding them. Uh, and it's crazy because the conviction starts out small, but it waxes greater, so much so that they say the Spirit forbid them from going. 
And so it's crazy because now they stop in their tracks and they pivot and they get ready to aim over in the land of Bithynia. But the Bible literally says that the Spirit would not permit them to go. And see, friends of mine, I need you to know that sometimes God is not going to shout. Sometimes God is not going to show up with a wet ground and a dry fleece or dry fleece and a wet ground. Sometimes you've got to have living spiritual faculties so that when God whispers your name and God gives you a prompting and God shows up, you can recognize that it's Jehovah talking. Are y'all with me today? And see, friends of mine, I believe this is why you've got to have an active spiritual antenna in a world with conflicting frequencies and conflicting opinions and conflicting voices and conflicting emotions. You've got an antenna that can find the reception of God and say, I know that's him talking to me. And let me just say this, especially to the young amongst us, I believe that your primary antenna are, is the Scriptures. All right, let me say it to the old folk because y'all seem like y'all don't believe either. I believe that the primary spiritual antenna is the Word of the living God. Are y'all with me today? You see, the Scriptures, my friend, are a revelation of His will. They are the primary expression of the mind of God. It gives us immovable principles to the, word, to the will of God. And see, one of the things I like about the Word is that the Word settles certain mass matters. The Word keeps me from having to think. The Word keeps me from being in conflict. And the thing about the Word is that it's not going to change based on who's reading it. In other words, the reason I'm saying this is because we operate too confused and too conflicted about things that the Lord has already spoken about. In other words, there'll be folk who come and they'll be like, Pastor, I'm praying about whether or not I need to forgive that person. And I'm thinking, you ain't got to pray about that. The Word has already spoken on this matter. The Word says, forgive as I have forgiven you. In fact, the Word says, don't even let the sun go down while you are angry. There's somebody saying, Pastor, I'm praying about whether or not I should get with this person who does not go to church. But the Word has already spoken on that matter because if they're not in church or even if they're in church but not in the Spirit, the Word says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers because there is no fellowship between light and darkness. Why are you praying about whether or not to take a job on the Sabbath? The Word has already spoken. The Bible says, in it thou shalt not do any work. Some of us are praying about whether or not I should divorce. The Word has spoken, except it be for marital infidelity. Oh, y'all mighty quiet in here. I'm going to stand on the Word whether you get married or not, uh, unless it be for marital infidelity, you got to stay with that one that you covenant to be with. And what I'm saying is, beloved, we operate confused and unsettled and conflicted as if the Word has not spoken. And we run around here saying, Pastor, I want the Spirit to speak. And the reason we want the Spirit to speak is because we don't like what the Word has said. And see, one of the things I know is that because the Spirit inspired the Scriptures, any spirit that conflicts with the Scriptures ain't holy. It ain't righteous. It's not in harmony with the will of God. Are y'all with me today, friends? And see, and that's why we've got to start being Bible students and not opinionists. <sighs> See, we got too many opinionists who may get their theology from Facebook, from the trends on Twitter, from false information on YouTube, but man shall not live by bread alone or by the opinions of man. You got to live according to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? One of the second ways you know God is talking to you, and, and tell me if I'm lying, one of the ways when God wants to get your attention is he'll withdraw his peace from your path. See, it's crazy because as they want to move forward, like every step they make toward Asia, there is a peace that is eroding in the process. 
they, they, there is that sense that the, they don't have that assurance that God is going to be with them. And see, one of the ways, young folk, that God tries to get your attention is that he will withdraw his peace from the path that you are attending. And see, friends, this is why you've got to have an active spiritual antenna. Because, see, the only way you can recognize when God withdraws his spirit is if you've been walking in the spirit. See, the only way you'll know if he withdraws his peace is because your life is filled with his peace. And see, the problem with some is that we are so void of the spirit and so detached from his peace. We are so spiritless that even when God withdraws the spirit, it's just like any other day to us. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And and can I just say this? Uh, You don't ever want to go anywhere in life without the peace of God all over your life. And what I need somebody to get is that peace is not circumstantial. Peace is relational. Peace is simply the outgrowth of being in a living connection with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And see, the reason I need you to get that peace is not circumstantial is because sometimes the circumstance can look benign. It can look like there is no danger. It'll appear that there is nothing wrong, but yet God will withdraw his peace because he sees around the corner and he sees danger where you see peace and safety. But guess what? The peace of God will attend you when you're going up the rough side of the mountain, God will give you peace when there are traps and snares along the way, and he will give you the assurance that I will be with you. And see, let me just say this about peace. See, peace, friends, is not an emotion. Peace is not a feeling. Peace is just an assurance Oh, God. Anybody ever just had peace about where you're going? Well, you just had an assurance that no matter how great the hill, no matter how great the obstacles, it doesn't matter how numerous the enemies are, you just know that if God is for you, that there is no circumstance that can stand against you. Are you hearing me today? And see, the problem with some of us is because we have no spiritual antenna. All of our judgments are secular. All of our measurements are by sight. All of our metrics are linear or according to common sense. But how many of us know that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man? But the end is the way of death. Are y'all hearing the word today? And see, and this is why you've got to have an antenna that's more in tune with the voice of God than it is with the opinions of people. Because see, what I need somebody to get today is that when you're being moved by God, people that are not on your frequency won't understand your movements. See, when you're being moved by the Spirit, you will always be misunderstood by those who are walking in the flesh. Crazy, just had this happen this week. David, I was down in Florida doing some presentations. And so literally Thursday morning, I wake up to work on this sermon I'm preaching. And so I sit down on the balcony of my hotel and I'm watching this guy walk up and down the side of the beach. And it's crazy because as I'm watching this guy walk up and down the street, I mean, I actually think that he's mentally ill or I think that maybe he's had a little too much to drink the night before. And the reason I'm doing this, thinking this, is as he's walking in the phone, he is not walking in a coherent straight line. But as he walks, man, he is kind of walking almost in a zigzag kind of way. I mean, every now and then he turns around in circles and I'm thinking, man, this boy is about to have the police called on him. I don't know what's wrong with him, but he is not walking in a way that I can understand. Now, fast forward an hour, Brother Booth. I decide I want to go out and walk along the beach myself. So, as I go, I want to FaceTime my wife and kids. And so, as I go, I'm trying to make sure I keep reception. But because the part of the beach was so remote, it was hard to maintain reception. And so what I'm doing is I'm following the reception, and so now I'm zigzagging like a fool, and, and, and I'm turning in circles all over the beach, and, and I'm stopping and going like I ain't got no sense. And if you're looking at me from the outside, you'll think I'm crazy. But they'll think you're crazy if they don't recognize your frequency. Oh, God. And what I'm saying 
is that when you got the signal of the Holy Ghost, they ain't got to understand how you move. They ain't got to know where you're going because if they don't have your frequency, they'll never understand your purpose and your mission. Are y'all with me today, friends? Second thing this story teaches us is that sometimes you'll never know what's on the other side of God's no. The Bible says, like, listen, they just want to go preach, Malcolm. They want to go preach the word. And the Bible literally says that the Holy Spirit forbids them to go. Now, I need you to get that the word uh, in the Greek for the word forbid is the word kalithentes, which literally means to prevent. It means to obstruct. It means to get in the path of. In other words, it literally paints the mental image of somebody going down a certain road, somebody standing on the other side to oppose their journey, and it literally paints the picture of a loved one saying, you're going the wrong way, but in order to go the wrong way, you're going to have to get through me first. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, the reason for the blockade is not necessarily given in the scriptures, but most scholars agree that there is some type of danger that they might not be able to survive, which is why God forbids them to go. Some suggest that they will face a persecution in Asia that they will not be able to live and tell the story from. And is there anybody that understands that sometimes God requires you to pivot, where sometimes the path is obstructed by God. Sometimes God will close doors. Sometimes God will cause your loved ones, man, to sound the alarm. Sometimes things will not work out as you hope them to be. See, the thing I look about God is that he never takes away the power of choice, but he makes it hard to act on bad choices. Anybody glad that every now and then God gets in your way, that he keeps you from a mistake? That he says, man, I'm not going to stop you from going the wrong way, but you're going to have to fight me in order to have to get there. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And can I just pause and just say this briefly, but as seriously as I can. There are some of us, man, that need to make a pivot because there's some danger on the road that you are on that you will not be able to recover from. I need, I need to speak a word of sabotage to somebody who thinks that because nothing happened last time or the time before, that grace is a license to sin. But how many of us know that every now and then God turns you around? See, there are some of us that need to make a serious moral pivot because there are some of us that are on the path of smoking and vaping, and you don't realize that there is no road to recovery on that path. There are some that need to pivot from the path of sexual experimentation and homosexuality because there is no recovery on that path. There are some that need to pivot from a life of vengeance because there is no recovery on that path. There are some that need to pivot from a life of cuffing in the winter because there is no recovery on that path. There are some young people that need to pivot from thug life or imitating thug life because that is a road that leadeth to death. You might not recover from that path. And see, some of us have been ignoring God so adeptly that we are immune to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. We are numb to when God even tries to create roadblocks and obstacles to keep us on a safe path. And I need somebody to know that for some, the road of a pivot is actually on the path of repentance. Does anybody realize that the word repent means to turn away or to turn around? And see, the problem with the current church is that we're good at confession, but we're very bad at repentance. You see, salvation is God's work on your behalf, but repentance is God's work in you to turn around from certain things. See, I need you to know that not only do you have to be forgiven, there's got to be some forsaking of the evil way. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And let me just pause and say this. That there is this, uh, what's the term? There is a praise 
that is too often omitted in the church. There, there is a praise that is somewhat imbalanced. Um, you notice that you never really have anybody preach this story that I'm talking about today. And the reason sometimes we don't preach about it or reference it is because there is no obvious miracle in the story. We are not clear as to why God forbids them or he does not permit them from going into a perceived area of danger. It's crazy because we love to shout over how God saved Daniel from the lion's den. And we're good over shouting about how God saved the three Hebrew boys from the fiery furnace. And we know how to rejoice and how God rescued them from the Red Sea, and we know how to rejoice when God allows David to defeat the Goliath. And the reason we rejoice in those stories is because the danger is obvious and the danger is more visible. And the problem is that some will only praise for divine rescue, but we will not praise for divine redirection. Okay. In other words, I need you to know that what providence does is that providence sees the trap down the line, calls you to pivot way back so that the plague doesn't even come near unto your dwelling. See, I serve the God that sits high and he looks low. He sees through time as though it were invisible. Can anybody praise the God that looks around the corner? He sees past last month. He sees past next year. He sees 10 years from now. And if anybody can praise God that he intercepted you so far from the danger that you never even saw the danger. In other words, I, I was telling the kids in worship two Friday nights ago, they say, man, daddy, we want to see more miracles. I said, don't worry about seeing miracles. you got to learn how to count your mercies. Mm. In other words, I thank God for how he kept the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. I thank God for how he kept Daniel in the lion's den. But I believe if they were here to preach, they would say, I thank God that he kept us in the furnace. I think he kept us from the lion's den. But I thank God when he keeps us from being in danger. Okay. Uh, see, see I, I need us to get to a place where we don't just praise God. See, I praise God because he's kept me in car accidents. But I wake up and praise God when he keeps me from car accidents. Uh, I saw y'all still not with me yet. I praise God that he kept me in some fights. But now I praise him that he keeps me from having to fight. I thank God that he's kept some in shootings. But can you praise him that he's kept you from mass shootings? Can, can anybody praise him that he kept you in poverty, but now you can rejoice because he's keeping you from poverty? And see, there's somebody that's waiting for a miracle. How many of us know that you'll only have seven or eight miracles, but you'll have more mercies than you can ever count? It is why Jeremiah says, it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Can the church shout, great is thy faithfulness. You don't realize you just inhaled the mercy. You just exhaled the mercy. When you waved, that was a mercy. When you stood, that was a mercy. When you ate, that was a mercy. When the plane landed, it was a mercy. When you got in school, it was a mercy. You may only have a few miracles. Ah, but can we praise him for the mercies that are endless and constant and unceasing? Praise God for his mercies. Are y'all hearing the word today? Listen. Third thing this teaches us is that sometimes God changes your path so your path doesn't change you. So they sense that the Spirit is telling them not to preach, so he creates a blockade. <laughs> I, mean, I can't get over this. He forbids them from going to preach. So then they say, okay, we're going to pivot. We're not going to go over there, Tage. We're going to pivot. We're going to go over to Bithynia. But then the Bible says that the Spirit would not, your version may say, suffer them to go. Another version says he won't permit them to go. 
So it's crazy because like that word in the Greek here is not as strong as the word forbid. It's the word eow, which means that the Spirit would not leave them alone. Since the Spirit would not leave them to their own devices. So what the Spirit does is He constantly pricks them until they alter their course. Now, this is the interesting thing about Bithynia. See, scholars believe that Bithynia is not dangerous. Bithynia was just going to be fruitless. Okay, all right. So, so there's a combination of things. The Spirit keeps them from going to Bithynia. But then God gives Paul a vision of a dream, and a dream of a man in Macedonia who is begging and pleading for you all to come and bring the gospel over here. And so when I look at it in its summation or totality, essentially what God is saying is that there is no fruitfulness in your work there. So I'm going to aim you to somebody who wants what you have to offer. Okay. So, so hear me. They're not going to receive what Paul has to say in Bithynia. It's going to fall on deaf ears in Bithynia. They're not going to be met with persecution. They're just going to be met with indifference. And see, what God is trying to show the Apostle Paul, that if you go over into Bithynia, you can sow, but you're not going to reap. You can invest, but you're not going to get a return. You can work hard, but there'll be no wages. You can make all the deposits you want in Bithynia, but you will be able to make not a single withdrawal from that area. And see, the efforts are so fruitless and the circumstance will be so discouraging that if Paul doesn't change the path, the path may change him. See, I need you to know what Bithynia does. It is that fruitless terrain of life that there is no success and there is no fruitfulness and it is no improvement. No matter how hard you pray, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you believe, because it is not God's plan, it is a fruitless terrain regardless of your effort. And the danger of Bithynia is that it affects your faith. It leaves a bad taste in your mouth. It'll cause you to lose months and weeks and years that you will never get back. You see, Bithynia is that stretch of life where the ground is fallow and hard. It represents those people, circumstances, and situations that are not ready to receive what God has given you. Are y'all are y'all listening to your boy today? And see, Bithynia is not a bad place, man. It's just not a ripe place. It's just not a fruitful circumstance. Are you hearing me? It is the place of wasted time, labor, and effort. It is a place of wasted investment. Bithynia is where you spent 20 years on that job only to still find yourself overworked and underappreciated. And after 20 years, you find out that there was a lid there and there was never any room for you to grow. Bithynia, young adult, is when you spend six years with the wrong person, only to realize you are preparing them for the next man or woman. Bithynia is when you start the business in the wrong season only to see it go belly up because it was ahead of schedule. Bithynia seniors is when you spend three years in the wrong major only to come to graduation and realize you spent $60,000 studying the wrong course. And see, the danger of Bithynia Church is not that it kills you. It just changes you. Bithynia takes something from you. Bithynia drains you. It exhausts you because when you've given so much to the wrong job, you show up jaded and unprofessional when God gives you the right job. It is where you've been so hurt by the wrong person that now you're cautious and rationing out love when God gives you the right kind of person. It is that season because you started the business under presumption. Now you're scared to start it when God is calling you to act according to faith. 
It is that place in life where you can recover in some ways, but what Bithynia does is it messes with you and breaks you in areas that you never, ever recover from. Oh, and can I just pause and say this? Man, what Bithynia does, and the most crushing thing about Bithynia is that it causes you to waste weeks and months and years and time that you never recover. See, I need somebody to get that you can regain money, you can recover things, you can rebuild friendships, but the one thing you never get back is the time you have wasted. There, there is no reclaiming of the time. Y'all hear what I'm saying? All the miracles in Scripture, you have literally seen God open up Red Seas. You've seen him cause the sun to be still. He's caused axe heads to float. He's called money to come out of fish's mouth. He has literally stopped storms. He has caused the dead to rise from their graves. But the one miracle God has never done is allow somebody to go back in time and get a do-over. So I'm going to tell, especially the young amongst us, don't waste your time. You're only going to be a teenager once in your life. You're only going to be in your 20s once in your life. You're only going to be in your early 30s once in your life. And you need to be careful how you invest some of those great years of your life because there is no recovering once they're gone. And see, folk who waste time, they want to tell the lie that 40 is the new 30. The arthritis in my knees says the devil is a lie. No, 40 is 40. Come on now. You can get all the bygene in your beard. The Greg is going to still show up. <laughs> yeah, I'm 40's the new 30. Yeah, all right. Keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Brothers, hear me. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time because everything that glitters ain't gold. <sighs> Young brother, if God shows you a woman who is the one, don't do that stupid thing where you try to put her on ice. Go live your best life and assume she's going to be wait waiting for you when you decide to come back home. No, man, if she is the one, you better do what Beyonce said. If you like it, you better, oh, y'all, y'all spiritual. Y'all love the Lord. Okay, okay, I, I can see who ain't saved. Hey, Amen. If you like it, then you better put a ring. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And well, in other words, ma'am, the one regret, even of a man who marries somebody later on, it doesn't matter how many women he has had in his youth, he never forgets the one that got away. And it's crazy because doesn't, doesn't Proverbs, Solomon, ooh, Solomon says it. He says, who can find a virtuous woman? Because her value is high above rubies. No, I don't know if y'all are getting this. He's saying when you find the one, I need you to know the one don't grow on trees. She is like a precious stone that you only come upon once or twice in a lifetime. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so you got to take this from Solomon who had all these wives and all these concubines and all these tents of women because Solomon teaches us that the love of many women still falls short of the love of the right woman. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? See, we stupid in our youth because many women makes you the man, but the right woman makes you the man God intended you to become. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. Ladies, don't waste your 20s and 30s waiting on his potential. If he's 37, that ain't potential. That's just, oh, y'all, 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 qual. That's who he is. Say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not in the sermon. But can I say this? Young sisters, uh, and I hate to go, young black women pay a high toll for wasting their 20s with the wrong guy. Because the, the, the inequity of life is sometimes men can fool around in their 20s and 30s and come back in the 40s and 50s and still find a good woman in the church. But how many 45, 50-year-old single men in this church? 
that love God. Successful, spiritual, and even if it's one, you're going to have to fight 17 women to get next to him. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> and seeing this is why you cannot waste your time in Bithynia because if you don't change your path, the path is going to change you because what Bithynia does is it takes away your faith. It takes away your optimism. It takes away your hopefulness. It takes away your creativity. It makes you settle in a place where God never ever intended you to be. So you've got to stop short of Bithynia. Last thing I'm going to say before I'm done is that sometimes a pivot requires patience. Now, the reason I had you read a whole lot at the beginning is so that you get some context for the sequence of events. I promise you I'm almost done. I promise you I'm almost done. Okay, I'm going to take my time. Amen. <laughs> hey, I was counting on somebody saying that. <laughs> if we get out late, blame this front row right here in the church. <laughs> A pivot requires patience. So, so remember, so God keeps them from going to Asia, keeps them from going over to Bithynia. But then God shows up in a vision or a dream to Paul. And, and what he sees in vision is a man who is pleading with him to come and help us over here in Macedonia. In other words, God is saying, listen, they don't want it to where you're trying to go, so I want you to take it to those who are going to receive it. Now, I'm not exactly sure exactly how Paul is going to interpret this thing. I don't know if he, when he goes into Macedonia, if he is literally going to look for the man in his dreams that is begging for him to come and help. Now, remember, when he goes into Macedonia, he first enters into the city of Philippi, and there he meets a woman named Lydia, who is a a seller of purple in the land of Thyatira. Now understand that Paul goes there looking for a man, but the first thing he finds is a woman who is hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he's already prepared the woman and opened her heart to receive the things that the apostle has to say. So that by the time they get there, they are hungry and waiting for the word. And the Bible says that her and her entire household get back ties. Now, this is the point. I'm sure he is rejoicing in their salvation, but perhaps there is a dissonance, a disconnect. Why? Because that's not the person he saw in his dreams. But don't get so caught up on the what you saw in your dreams that you pivot out of the providence that God is leading you into. And see, what I'm saying to somebody is that sometimes you got to wait and allow all of the dots to be connected because, see, there is somebody who is literally frustrated because you made a pivot in faith and you stepped out and things have not worked out like you wanted them to. You still don't have the job of your dreams. You don't live in the house of your dreams. You don't have the person of your dreams. You're not in the ministry of your dreams. And what I'm saying to somebody is that when you don't see with your eyes what God showed you in your dreams, you've just got to be still and allow God to connect the Ah, Y'all hear what I'm saying? Okay. Stay with your boy for a second. So, so God goes in the Philippi, see, see, sees Lydia, who, who is the seller of purple in her in Thyatira. And the Bible says her and her whole household get baptized and one dot is connected. But then the Bible says that they go down into the house of prayer, but then they find a little servant girl who's got an evil spirit that would annoy Paul each and every day. And your boy Paul gets so mad that the authority of God erupts, and he just calls the evil spirit out of that girl. And then the girl shows up clothed in her right mind. He didn't come for the girl. That's not who he saw in his dreams. But when he meets the girl, another dot is connected. 
Now, when all the men of Macedonia show up, Paul thinks, okay, here comes the men in my dreams. But guess what? They don't come to congratulate Paul. They mad because their money is going to get cut short because he has called the evil spirit out of that girl. And they begin to peep, ball, beat Paul with rods and they throw him into jail. And for a minute, I think your boy Paul may be tripping Steve. Because Paul is like, you wouldn't forbid me to go there because of the danger there. But you let me get beaten here and jailed here. But the thing I like about Paul is that he does not allow his faith to get overwhelmed by circumstance. So the Bible says that they throw him bloody and beaten into a prison. But the Bible says that at midnight... He wasn't up complaining and whining. At midnight, the Bible says that Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises unto God. And the Bible says that the prisoners heard them. And because they were praising at midnight, the Bible says that the earth began to quake. The ground began to shake. The prison doors got open and suddenly all their bands were loose and all the men were there listening to the gospel. And it's crazy now because Paul still hadn't seen the man in his dreams. But then there is a guard of the prison who has a sword and is about to off himself. And Paul says, do yourself no harm because we are already here. And then the Bible says that then this man that Paul saw in his dreams comes to Paul begging and asking, what must I do in order to be saved? We didn't want it over before, but guess what I want it right now, Paul? They didn't want it in Asia. They didn't want it in Bithynia. But me and these prisoners are sitting here ready to receive everything you have in store for me. So in other words, Lydia was a connected dot. The little girl was a connected dot. The magistrates were a connected dot. The prisoner guard was a connected dot. And it was only when the dots got connected that you could see how the spirit moves. Okay, some of y'all still not with me. All the teachers, y'all remember when, when, when you need your students to be quiet, you give them a connect the dots puzzle. And see, how many of us understand that when you first connect the dots, you can't see what it's going to become. <laughs> so if just a couple dots get connected, you can't see what it is. When four dots get connected, you can't see what it is. But sometimes patience is required. So sometimes you just got to let God keep connecting because there's some things that don't make sense in the beginning. It don't make sense in the middle. It don't make sense along the way. In fact, you still can't see what it is, even though a lot of dots have been connected. So you just got to keep letting God work. You got to keep letting God move. You got to keep letting God draw. Uh-oh. <laughs> I may have to go back to school and pray for the preacher today. In other words, you can't see it until all the dots, because some of y'all see what it might be, but you still can't tell what it is until all the dots come together. See, before... It just looked like a bunch of dots, but you can't see the dove until all the dots come together. Y'all missed it. You can't see what the dove is doing until all the dots come together. And how many of us know that the Holy Spirit is the dove and you can't see what he's up to when just a couple dots or most dots. You've got to let all the dots come together 
before you see what the Spirit is making. Are y'all hearing the word today, my friends? And what I'm saying to somebody as I take my seat is that you feel like God has forgotten you. When all this happened, is he's only connected three dots. You feel like God has forsaken you, and God has only connected ten dots. You feel like God is not hearing your prayers when he's only connected half or two-thirds of the dots. But sometimes, friends of mine, you got to let it play out. You just got to sit still, and you just got to pivot until God connects all the dots. And by the time he connects the dots, you're going to have a whole picture, your whole life, your whole ministry, all your relationships, your friendship, your calling, your pain. It's all a part of the process. But you've got to let God connect the dots in your life. How many of us believe the Word of God today? And what I'm saying to somebody today is that sometimes you can't see the goodness of God with foresight. Sometimes you got to let it play out and you'll see the goodness of God when you look back on that thing. And you'll even see how in medical challenge God was connecting dots. When you were so broke you couldn't pay attention God was connecting dots. Young brother, young sister, when that person walked out the door on you, God was connecting some dots. In the midst of some of the most intense marital pain, God is not abandoning you. He is still connecting dots. And see, until it's connected, everything just looks broken and disjointed and out of order. But see, I need you to know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So I want to encourage somebody that God is maybe calling you to a pivot to help you avoid danger. He's calling you to a pivot so that you can avoid fruitlessness. I need you to raise your spiritual antenna and be willing to move when God says move. Somebody shout hallelujah today. Let's sing this together. It just says, just to be close to you. One voice, just. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. It's my desire. If that's your testimony this morning, just to just be close. To be you can sing it from where you are, just to be close. Just to be close to you. Just to be. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. It's my desire. Just to be close. Just to be close to you. Come on, just to be close. Just to be close to you. Just to be close. Just to be close to you. Is my desire. Is my desire. It says just to be close. Just to be close to you. We want to get close to him just. Just to be close to you. Just to be. Just to be close to you. Is my desire. Says just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. It's my desire. Just to be, just to be close to you. Just to be
you believe that this morning, you can stand with us, you can sing, draw me nearer, draw me For the past 49 years, Breath of Life has been presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ from a contemporary urban perspective. In 2023, we plan to grow our reach and your donations are what help make that possible. This year, our major goal is to launch our Breath of Life weekly broadcast into five new cities. In addition, we're excited to introduce our new Breath of Life Kids platform with original content created with your little ones in mind. We'll continue with innovative programming, dynamic preaching, and sharing the gospel through evangelistic campaigns. Here are the five ways that you can give. You can give online at breathoflife.tv, by mail at P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama, 35814, by phone at area code 256 929 6460 or by texting the phrase give the number two BOL TV to 1888 364 give or by cash app at dollar sign breath of life TV. Every single dollar you give goes right back into the ministry and allows us to share the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. We pray that God's favor will overtake you as a result of your generous gifts to Breath of Life. God bless you.